In today's lecture, we are going to continue our look at maxima and minima, ex so-called extreme values. Last time, we looked at a new test called the second derivative test. And that second derivative test involved second derivatives. Now, it's not a, a magic cure-all type um, test, the second derivative test. It is powerful, but it does have limitations. In today's lecture, we're going to look at closed and bounded domains in the xy plane. Probably the best way to get you an idea of, of how to tackle these kinds of problems is um, through an example. Okay, now I'm going to go through this in a very detailed fashion and give you all the ideas. At the end, I'll also show you a quicker way of solving this problem. Okay? So th this, is a, this is the main focus of today's lecture, this particular example. So suppose I've got a, um, a, a circular plate, and that plate lies in the xy plane. And it's thin, and at each point in the plate, there's a temperature associated with the, that position. So here's our temperature function. Here's the region that sort of um, is, our, uh, is covered by our plate. Where is the plate the hottest and the coldest? And what are the temperatures at these points? Now, just to give you a sort of an idea here, in this particular example, I've well, here's a, a plot of the level curves of T. Okay, now when we talk about temperature functions, I, I guess those level curves have a, um, a special name called isotherms, right? So the blue curve in this case is like the, the edge or the boundary of, um, of my disk or my plate. Now, hopefully, you can see, at least from this picture, where an extrema th th might occur. Anybody have any idea? Anyone? Yeah. It looks like maybe in there. OK? That would be my guess. But that doesn't tell you really. Um, anything about the boundary, what's happening on the boundary. So that would be sort of, you know, an initial guesstimate, if you like. Pay attention to that point. Um, you'll also see that if I sort of move in this direction, the level curves are getting closer and closer together. So that might suggest that if we do have extrema, well, they, they, they'd be located sort of on that, near this point and this point. Now, you don't always have a picture, though, of the isotherms. So what I'm going to show you is a systematic way to solve these kinds of problems, and then at the end I'll show you, you know, a better, a better way for this particular problem. The good thing about showing you the general method is that it'll work for, you know, most problems. The good thing about showing you the time-saving method is that, well, if you get a particular problem, you can save a lot of time in exams, okay? So, I guess it's a two-step process. What you do is, you try to apply the second derivative test inside the disk. So, you want to test for critical points inside the disk, not on the edge, but inside. And then the second step of the process is that you just concentrate on the edge or the boundary of the disk and look for maxima and minima on the boundary. Okay, so these are the two, the two um, cases. So let me um, solve this in some detail for you. So part one, um, let's call this, um, say, uh, omega. So omega is just the set of points that sort of 
sort of comprise our disk. Okay, so Uh, we want to find the points in the inside or the interior of our disk that are critical points. So they have to satisfy x squared plus y squared strictly less than 1. And, this, I mean, this is a polynomial, so you know, it, no, no, it, no problem um, taking these partial derivatives and setting them equal to 0. So remember by the subscript here, t sub x means dt dx. t sub y means dt dy. Okay, so let's calculate these partials, test to see whether they're in the interior, and then we can classify them, right? So we're going to so t sub x is going to be something like two x minus one, and you set that equal to zero. And t sub y, dt dy, is going to be something like 4y equals 0. So these are easy equations to solve. Obviously, y is going to be 0 and x is going to be positive 1 half. So our critical point... ...is just 1 half 0. So Let's compare that with the picture that we just saw. Yep, that looks like about right. That looks like one half zero. So it sort of confirms what we were speculating about before. The second observation is, is this critical point inside the, the region of interest? Yes, it is. So now what we can do is classify that critical point. Does that critical point lead to a local min? a local max, or something in between, the so-called saddle point, which is like a point of inflection. So let's classify it. So I'm going to try to use a second derivative test. Okay, so for the second derivative test, we need second derivatives. So t sub x, x, to just differentiate this respect to x, that will be 2. t sub y, y, if I differentiate that with respect to y, I'm going to get 4. And t sub x, y, the mixed partial, is just going to be 0. Okay. All right, note that this is positive. And our determinant, which I've called D, which is just the following. You want to look at the sign of this. Okay, so I'm going to get 8 minus 0 which is positive. So, if we apply the second derivative test, we see that this d value is positive, right? So, so the point's either going to be a local max or a local min, and t sub xx, this second derivative is positive. So, what kind of point is that 1 half comma 0? Is it a local max or a local min? Local min. Right. And so, we have a local minimum temperature. So let's work that out. Um, if I sub 
x equals a half and y equals zero into here, I'm going to get a, um, a quarter minus a half, which is minus one quarter. Okay, so I've located the position of a local minimum and I've calculated the value of the temperature at that point, or the, the, the temperature. Now sometimes there's cases where you have more than one critical point. In this case, there's only one. Okay? If there was more than one critical point, you'd have to go through and test each critical point, the, the sort of, um, you know, look at, look at that D function at different critical points. Okay, so that's um, in the interior of our plate. What happens on the boundary? What happens on the boundary? Well, I guess this is like part two. On the boundary, what's the curve that's satisfied? Well, it's just x squared plus y squared equals 1. So actually what I'm going to do is just look at the temperature function along the boundary. Now I could actually just sort of rearrange this and replace um, you know, uh, y squared with 1 minus x squared. But actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to break it down into two parts where you look at the top part of the circle and the bottom part of the circle. The only reason I'm doing this is because along those um, curves, y is a function of x. So along this curve, y equals positive root 1 minus x squared. And along this curve, y equals negative root 1 minus x squared. Okay, so I'm going to break it up into, into parts. Okay. So on the top half, we've got y equals root 1 minus x squared for x between minus 1 and 1. Let's look at the temperature function along that point. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to replace y with positive root 1 minus x squared and form a function of x. Okay, so, so I'm going to introduce, say, some function, which is just g. Now, if I sub this in for y, then you know that square root's going to disappear. So I'll get something like this. And if I clean up the algebra, So I've got this function like this. Okay, so g of x is just parabola, parabola on the interval minus 1 to 1. Okay, so what, I, what, I, what I'm going to do now is calculate the critical, this is just function of one variable now, right? So I think back to high school, how would you calculate the maximum and the minimum values of g for x between minus 1 and 1? Well, you could draw a picture. Right? Or you could calculate the critical points of G, set them equal to zero, work out the value of G at that point, and also test the endpoints. Okay? So if you're going to use calculus here, you would differentiate this, set it equal to zero, and, and proceed along that route, but you also need to check the endpoints. Okay? So So if I differentiate here, I'm going to get something like minus 2x minus 1. And that equals 0 when x equals negative a half. OK, so what's the corresponding y point for that? Well, 
Well, if I go up to my, you know, if x equals negative a half, y will be something like root 3 on 2. Okay, so that's just from this y equals root 1 minus x squared. Okay, so let's test the value of g at that point. So if I plug in g equals minus a half into here, just here, I'll get something like this. Two and a quarter. So, relating, so, so what does that mean for our temperature function? Well, t, big T, of minus one half, root 3 on 2 is this value here, 2 and 1 quarter. Now, I haven't tested the endpoints yet. Okay, so a lot, of, a lot of students forget to test the endpoints of the interval. You know, here we have x is between minus 1 and 1. So we need to check the endpoints of the interval. So if I say take the right hand endpoint and sub it in here, what am I going to get? I'm going to get minus 2 plus 2, oops, which is just 0. So now when x equals 1, y is 0. So t of 1, 0 is going to be 0. That's the temperature. And let's test the other endpoint, x equals minus 1. Um, if you plug that into this, you'll get positive 2. Okay, so what information have we got so far? Well, we've got that value for my temperature, that value for my temperature, that value, and on the previous page, we had this value. Okay? So that's what happens on the top, the top sort of edge. On the bottom edge, it's very similar. So let me... So that's the top edge. Now... So... Now you just follow the same steps, I'm not going to put them in, but essentially you're going to get the following. Okay, in fact if you sub this in you'll get the same function as g. You're Okay, so it's just basically, you sort of got a mirror in the, in the um, x-axis and, you know, you'll get the following. Okay, so this is the other important information. So I'll leave you to fill in the details for the bottom sort of part of the curve. Okay. So we've got a lot of information there. What we would do now is compare all of our values. All of our values. So you can see on the previous page the temperature at, at the local minimum, the, the, the temperature was minus a quarter. Okay? Over here, our values were two and a quarter, zero, two, and two and a quarter. So what we want to do is pick the maximum value out of that list of numbers and the minimum value out of that list of numbers. Okay? So the minimum value is going to be minus a quarter. 
Okay, that's, that's what we had over here. So actually, at this point, that will be the lowest temperature on, inside the plate, and the, the temperature value will be minus one quarter there. Now, there are two maximum values, if you like, or two places where a maximum occurs, this point and this point. Now, if you look carefully, it's actually what we predicted. It's there and there. So that's the min that point will lead to a minimum value, and that point and that point will lead to a maximum value. Okay, so let's um, write our conclusion. So, what do we see? Well, we see the minimum value of T on or temperature on our set, our little, is just minus one quarter at this position, and the maximum value in our plate is two and a quarter, and this happens at two points, okay? It happens at mm, minus one half root three on two, and minus one half negative root three on two. Okay, that's the reasonably long version of that problem. Now, the good thing about showing you the long version is that, that that method will work for lots of different problems. Okay? Lots of different problems. Now, let's work smarter, not harder, for a minute. Can anyone suggest how we might save time in this problem? Anyone? Yeah, the isotopes give us a, a good idea of what's going on uh, graphically, but we don't always have the isotopes, right? But yes, yes, absolutely. Um, we saw at, at the start of the problem, we thought, well, that looks like some sort of extrema, and maybe if we head in this, these directions, there's going to be something happening on the boundary. Anyone else? Yes? Yeah, now you're talking. Yeah, now you're talking. Very good. Okay. What kind of function is this function? Well, it's almost, it's almost a paraboloid. Okay, if I covered up that, that minus x, that would be a paraboloid, right? But what can I do? Well, all I can do is to sort of turn it into a, para, a sort of paraboloid is complete the square in x. So maybe I can write the temperature function as a sort of in a simpler, more usable form. Uh, what was it? So it's x squared minus x. So if I complete the square in x, so you take the coefficient of x, halve it, square it, add it, and take it away. So if I square that, uh, sorry, that'll be a minus, minus one quarter. Okay, so I haven't changed the problem. I've just added something and taken and taken something away. Now, what I can do is factorize here. And get this. So, who can tell me what's the idea of doing that? Well, this uh, <laughs> for the benefit of you at home. This is always greater than or equal to zero. This is always greater than or equal to zero. 
When are these two terms equal to zero? Well, when x equals a half and when y equals zero, those first two terms are zero. So you can see that the minimum temperature is going to be minus a quarter. Okay? Can you see that? So this is minus a quarter. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's always sorry. It's always greater than or equal to minus a quarter, and that's just the value of the temperature when x equals a half and y equals zero. So actually, if we were thinking a bit broadly here, we don't need the second derivative test. You don't even need to compute a derivative. Okay, this must be by definition not only a local minimum but a global minimum. It's got to be a minimum for all x and y. So we know as long as this point is in our is in our um, our plate, the minimum temperature must be minus one quarter at x equals a half, y equals zero. Now, getting back to your thing about symmetry. With our temperature function, if I replace y with minus y, does it change the temperature at all? No, because you're squaring it. Okay? So, as you said, there's symmetry about this axis. So, you know, if I draw a, um, so at this point, say, the te oh, hang on, Let, let's say uh, at this point, the temperatures of these two points must be the same. Okay? So, I mentioned paraboloids before. Is this kind of a paraboloid? Well, it is. All it is, it's the paraboloid x squared plus 2y squared, minus a quarter, moved half a unit. Moved half a unit along the x-axis. Okay? So, you would expect it to have a global minimum, and you know that it's sort of rising in, in all directions. So, you'd expect the maximum to happen on that, on that circle. Okay? So, another observation. So, in this form here, It's a paraboloid. Okay, now the paraboloid would be, instead of a regular paraboloid that's sort of wrapped around the positive <coughs> OX axis, this would be wrapped around the, um, the line X equals 1. Uh, yeah, uh, X equals 1, Y equals 0. So this is a vertical line. Okay? So you would expect, because it, it's like a it's like a bowl, you would expect the maximum to occur on the on the boundary of the, of that of, of, of well, the boundary of, the, of your plate. Okay, so what I'm trying to do here is to get you to work smarter. You know, don't just you know, don't just blindly follow um, rules all the time, um, sometimes you can save a lot, a lot of time. Didn't even have to compute a derivative to find the, the, the minimum value. How good is that? Okay, just by completing the square. Questions? Questions? Now, if you, of course, if you've got a, if you've got a question in, say, your, your class test or something, saying, use the second derivative test to blah, 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 and you thought you'd be a bit cute and go, oh, no. You know, Chris told me to be a rebel. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> well, I'd give you bonus points, but I'll tell you something I really like to see. 
I really like to see students who actually complete the question as as you know as the as the questions are asked using the, the methods that's that's asked right, and then at the end they say, oh, this is to be expected because of this, or you know this is obvious because of this. Okay, that's good. That's really good because it shows that you understand things I in several ways, which is desirable. Questions? Yes. Um, okay, that's a good question. For, for the boundary conditions, um, well, put it like this. For the boundary conditions on this particular um, um, example, you could have used symmetry, right? So, you know, if you found this point, you could say, well, because of symmetry, the other um, sort of max min type point has to lie, you know, sort of on this vertical line. Okay, that would be fine. I'd be happy with that. Okay, um, now sometimes, sometimes you've got, this, this is a pretty simple region because I can break it down into two sort of curves. But let me show you something where, you, d d you don't have to write this down, but just let me show you something where, um, where you might get, you know, let's say, instead of a, instead of a disc, I've got a box or you know, a, a filled rectangle. And that's, that's our domain of interest. Okay? And this is where it gets very frustrating if you don't use things like symmetry or um, something like this. Theoretically, what you would have to do here is, um, let's, say, let's say some function, right? And this is like 1 and this is 3 and say this is 1 and this is 4 or something like that, okay? So th th this would be your omega now. Okay? Yeah, it's not drawn to scale. What you would have to do is compute the critical points inside like, of your function. And then you would have to work with four edges. You would have to do that edge, that edge, that edge, and that edge. Okay? So theoretically, you would have to examine maxima and minima, minima along every edge of that shape. That's going to take you a long time. Okay? So this is what I mean. If you can use symmetry or something like this for the edges, you definitely should. Okay? You definitely should. And in fact, um, I've, I've got a, a question that solves this one using symmetry um, online. Okay, so this is probably the most important slide of this of the last two lectures. The summary of the max min tests. Extreme values of a function of two variables can only occur at either boundary points of the set. So you know we were working in the, with a plate. Points on the edge, and critical points, so interior points, so points in, inside, not on the boundary, where the, partial, the first partials are equal to zero. Okay? Now, This is like a summary of a second derivative test. Suppose I have a point. That satisfies these equations. Then. You can test whether the, the point leads to a local max, a local mean or something in between the saddle point using the second derivative test. Okay, and um, the, you know, probably the hardest thing to remember are, are these things here. Are you, I like to remember them as a determinant of a special matrix called the Hessian matrix. Now, part four is important. If this value here at your critical point equals zero, then the test is inconclusive. You cannot apply the test. It doesn't tell you anything. 
right? So, and last lecture we talked a little bit about how we might overcome that uh, that potential problem, right? Um, you know, there were suggestions about sketching the surfaces, drawing the level curves, using algebra um, to to forge some some new path.